Hey y'all, welcome to Conversations with Heavy Cardboard. I'm excited today to welcome a cool dude to the show. He's the designer of numerous games ranging from winsome games like Iberian and Irish Gage in Northern Pacific to war games and logistics games in the upcoming 4X, most of which uh, are under his own publishing house, Hollenspiel. He's also an indie filmmaker, published author, and baker. Who knew? I am, of course, talking about Tom Russell of Hollenspiel. Welcome to Heavy Cardboard, Tom. Hello. Thank you. So uh, let's start with the heavy hitting stuff. How was last okay. night's peach cobbler, and did you get the stove <laughs> fixed? Uh, no, the, the oven is not fixed. I had to go to my uh, grandmother's house to use her oven to cook the beach cobbler, which, which was okay. Just okay though? Really? It, it wasn't, it wasn't a great peach cobbler. I'm not, it was my first peach cobbler. I mean, maybe, maybe my second or third would be better. You know? All right. Fair enough. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's start with the obvious question. We'll get this stuff out of the way early and then we'll go from there. So what got you started in that, this wonderful hobby of board games of ours? Oh man. Well, see, the thing is there are like six different answers to that question and they're all right. They're all, they're all correct. The good news it's, is we don't have a time frame, So I, I know, start with one but, and end with six. There we go. But what, what it was <laughs> is I had a, a number of different uh, threads in my life, as it were, that all kind of came together and all pointed towards board games. Okay. Um, and it all kind of happened around the same time. To give you a little bit of context uh, for that, because I, I often say that board games discovery and it kind of saved my life. And I, I mean that um, seriously. Um, before I got into board games, I was always a kind of creative person and uh, trying to do different things uh, creatively, like the filmmaking, uh, writing novels, right. I did some video games, I've, I've done all sorts of different things, but none of them uh, was I ever able to really connect with an audience the way I wanted to, uh, or to make any kind of, of living at it. And I kind of was just pushing myself all through my 20s trying to find the thing and I really was kind of not, not really great to live with because I was just pushing myself all the time on, on that. And uh, a lot of that also had to do with kind of a, a weird like fear of mortality kind of thing where I want to make every, every minute count. Everything had, everything had to count and I wasn't going to waste my time doing this, that, or the other thing that wasn't, you know, the work, the art, whatever. Wow. That's uh, deep. Okay. All right. And, um, and I was kind of, kind of stressing myself out, making myself sick. And eventually I got so sick that uh, I got an infection. I almost died from it. Um, I got better, obviously. Right. Um, but, but that kind of made me stop and think about how I was living my life. And uh, really just made me try to be a better person and be more open to the things around me, experiences around me. And that's when the board games kind of came in. So we were, uh, this is one of the ways I got into board games. Um, we were in Ann Arbor with a friend. Mary and I were uh, with a friend in Ann Arbor. Um, Mary being your, your wife, wife and, and partner uh, in, in Hollenspiel, Hollenspiel, right? Yeah. Um, and we were just like hanging out in, in, the, in the stores uh, in Ann Arbor, which I never would have done before because I'd be too busy working on a script or working on programming a video game or, or something okay. and while we were there we were at a comic book store and in the basement of the store they had a bunch of modern board games that i had never seen anything like this before and when was uh, this it, would you say um would that have been like 2010 2011 somewhere in, in, in around there okay so i'm really right. really recent to the hobby Okay. Um, All right. But, like me, I mean, I joined yeah. in 2013, so I get that. They, yeah. They they had uh, kind of the centerpiece was this huge deluxe, like three hundred dollar version of some game called Catan that I had never heard of. <laughs> that was like, why why does this exist? Why why is there this this huge deluxe version of of this game? And then there's all these other games 
and they have the names of the authors on it and who is this Reiner Kinesia guy? <laughs> and so all that's going on. Around the same time, like a couple days later, I'm on uh, Wikipedia hitting the random article button, which is just a great way to find out about stuff. Sure, right? just go down ran and, random rabbit holes, right? And and the, the random article button pulls up this this thing called 18xx. <laughs> and, and there is uh, a video from some guy named Scott Nicholson about... 18xx and he has other videos about board games and around the same time uh i have a have a small surgery related to the infection that had been taken care of and while i'm recovering from that there's this video game i've been working on and the thing with me with the video games is that i don't really have the the capacity to program really well okay like it was always a struggle for me so anytime I was doing anything in a video game, I would spend all night trying to do one little thing and then find out that that had screwed up something else. I spent all in and just, I can never really get it to work. And while I'm recovering from the surgery, I'm thinking about this video game I'm working on and how, you know, after maybe two months, I'll finally have it to the point where I can start testing it and see if it's fun or not. Okay. And I said, you know, what if I can find some way to, to test it physically right to see if it's fun before i do the programming and that's how i designed what was basically my first board game and i tested it and then like i needed to make a change and three minutes later i had made the change it didn't take me all night it took three minutes i was like this this is great this is a lot more uh yeah. time efficient yes <laughs> exactly and so all these things kind of happened at once and came together and got me into uh, modern board games got me interested in them and we so we picked up a couple of games um the first we got two uh at one time one was carcassonne i don't remember what the second one was i don't think we liked it as much <laughs> um and that's kind of how i got into games and uh really into the euro games that's really where i kind of started okay and i pretty quickly wanted to start designing uh the games uh, and I was designing like light and medium weight Euro games. I just could not sell any of them. Uh, it was weird because I thought, well, I'm going to do these light, medium weight Euro games. It'd be my niche. And then like, oh, as like a lark, I'll do these, these weird little war games and train games. And that's, you know, what I'll do for fun to be interesting, but I'm going to concentrate on these Euro type games and the Euro games never sold. The other one's dead. And that's kind of how I uh, came to focus on train games and war games. And all those things happened at once, and they all, uh, you know, I also had to be in the right frame of mind to to be open to it. Because, uh, and here's a perfect example of that, uh, back before I got into the board games and I was doing the video games, I would get a lot of books on programming and uh, game design for computer games from my local library. Okay. And thanks to the the vagaries with Dewey Decimal System, they had a book in there which was uh, the Complete War Games Handbook by James Dunnigan, who's <laughs> you know the guy who the FBI guy. Sure. And at the at time, you know, I'm not open to board games, so I get this, I read this book, and I'm like, what? What is this with the cardboard? No, <laughs> tell me about the programming. There's not much here. I don't, I don't care. Get it away from me. And but then coming to it again and this happened like two or three days after i started learning about board games i came across the book again and i was like oh this is great oh wow so, oh how so it all comes around circular yeah huh? yeah so so <laughs> that kind of threw me off because you you said <laughs> that that the euros that you were designing you couldn't get sold but you were you were having success with with your uh train games and war games well, well, here, well, here's the thing with with like the, the Euro style games. I think is I'm not going to say that they were derivative. They weren't intentionally derivative anyway. Okay. But I didn't really have a lot of depth of, of knowledge about all the different games that were out there. So I would create something and, and, and labor over it, and then turn out that something like that already came out a year or two ago. 
Okay. And oh, so you you seem to be behind the curve, so to speak. I seem to be behind the curve, and I didn't um, get a whole lot of um, well, because you know, in a way, board games. I mean, they're kind of a luxury hobby. Sure. You know, and if you don't have like a luxury income, like I, I was buying maybe three games a year when we started in the hobby because we didn't have the money to plop down that kind of money on, on a bunch of games. Whereas there are people we knew at the same game store who, you know, what games did they get this week? Right. You know? um, and we didn't have that uh, available to us. Okay. Um, so there were a lot of games that I, you know, really didn't get into that maybe I would have enjoyed, you know, uh, and games that I was apparently um, designing similar games, but not not knowing that they were similar. Right. Not having that background of, you know, yeah. a wide range of game. That, that makes sense. I get that. So... But what is it, I guess, about war games and train games either appealed to you other than, you know, hey, I can sell these. Uh, but what is it about those specifically that appealed to you and made you, like you said, you had to be in a certain uh, frame of mind to be able to do this? Well, the train games, um, to start with the train games, you know, basically it was less train and more more winsome to a degree sure now sure. I, I i i had liked the learning about the 18xx and i i played a couple of them a couple of times i haven't really had the kind of dedicated group where i could play it uh play those very frequently fair enough but uh the winsomes at least the 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 the, the licensed republished versions of the winsomes were popular at at the game store Ah, so I got Chicago you. Express, um, German Railways, right? Yeah. yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I enjoyed playing those a lot, and uh, I, I just I, I liked the whole uh, multiplayer aspects of it—the emergent alliances, the the stock uh, aspects. Now, I'm terrible at them. I'm terrible <laughs> at stock games. Mary, Mary, Mary is great at them, and. I, I'm the kind of person who will like bid two hundred dollars for a, a share right for the end of German Railway. So it's like, why? Why did I do that? You know, <laughs> and, and just basically, it's worthless, right? Sure, yeah. I get that. So, but, um, so it's the whole adage: those who do, do, and those that don't, design. Is that what you're saying? I mean, <laughs> I don't know about that, but. But with the Winsomes, like it, it was, it was the games were really appealing to me. And I, at that point, I was thinking, okay, I want to get better at designing games. I want to learn my my craft, as it were, mm -hmm. right? And I need to work with like really good developers. And these guys, from all I've heard, John Bohr is is a, is a really good developer, and it turned out to, to be true. So I said, I'm going to design a game specifically with Winsome in mind. Okay. And that ended up being Northern Pacific. And if they hadn't accepted it, I don't know where I would have shopped that around to. You yeah, know, it's, that it's, that's it's, a that <laughs> that's a limited market right there, right? Yeah, Cuz yeah. for those that are unfamiliar with Northern Pacific, ah, uh, you know what? I have the designer here. Why don't you describe that? I mean, it's a game that has two rules. <laughs> you either either place an investment or you place a train to try to connect to that investment. And that really is it. I mean, it's really just focused on those kind of, if I do this, he's going to do that, and he should do that, and kind of emergent alliances and all that kind of stuff. And how as turn it, order can affect that and yes. everything else. And it's as streamlined a package as possible. And I uh, submitted that to Winsome. Now, if, that wasn't my first idea for a Winsome design. I tried to do more like a traditional uh, you know, stock holding cube rails kind of thing. And okay. I just couldn't, um, I think I was a little, not scared, but, but apprehensive about like, oh, I don't want to send something to win some. It turns out it's terrible. And they don't want to work with me and so on and so forth. So, so fear of rejection but, then? Kind yeah, of? yeah, yeah, to a degree. And then uh, when I played um, Paris Connection. Mm -hmm. I said, SNCF, okay, I, I, the original uh, being, yeah. right. I can do something much simpler. And I, 
and and that was Northern Pacific. And when I when I turned it over to, to Winsome and they said yes, they wanted to publish it, um, you know, they really did a great job developing that game. It doesn't seem like it's a game that needs a lot of development, but the map in Northern Pacific uh -huh. is completely different and twice as large as the map that I originally submitted. Really? Yeah, yeah, and they they really just took what were my ideas and just made them sing. Now, the next game I did with them, which was Irish Cage, that pretty much was exactly the game I I submitted to them. Which is, uh, to this date, my all-time favorite winsome, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Right, yeah, thank you so, for so. coming up with that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad I did. It, it seems to be the one of, of those winsome games that are uh, that's the most popular with people, because uh, North and Pacific is really divisive like people either love it or hate it or it is a game or it's not a game i that's the uh, that's the discussion or the argument that i've heard is this even a game da 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 da, da and all that it's, and it's the game. more you play it the more it becomes uh i know that you know that i know that you know that i know that i should do this which means you should do this but then if i don't and it it becomes just this huge meta game it really really mm -hmm. does become that yeah and, and that's that, that's what I like about it. And, <laughs> and, and when I did Northern Pacific, I thought, everyone's going to love this. This is going to be great. And uh, I kind of feel that way about every game I do. Like, this, everyone's going to love this. And they either they do or they don't, you know, and, <laughs> as it turns out. But uh, Winsome, like, they are really good at, at developing those games. Because at, at, they know when... To, to have a light hand and when to have a heavier hand. They know what to do to make the game what it needs to be. And uh, I learned a lot just from that. You know, um, I've, so... I, I've talked to John Bohr a number of times and the the development team that he has with him, it's it's pretty mm -hmm. impressive how they're able to churn these out year after year after year, the, mm -hmm. the Winsome Collection every year. Oh, yep, yeah. and... Uh, the great thing is, um, so when he uh, said yes to do North, North and Pacific, he said um, that any time he signs on with, with a new author, uh, he, he very specifically uses the word author for yep. games, um, he has to meet that person in person. He came up to Michigan to meet me and Mary, which no other publisher has, has ever done that I've worked with. Interesting. Uh, Did he say why that was? Uh, I I never really asked, but okay. um, I, think, I think just to get the, the measure of me and, and vice versa. And, you know, I, I had, so I, I'm on the internet. I, I have I have read things about John Bohr, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, I'm not going to say I was, I was a little worried, but, but, you know, meeting him, he was just perfectly charming. <laughs> And and just very straightforward and and very funny and 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 the way I would describe it is he's he he has all the best lines but makes you feel like you're the center of attention. Yes, that's that's and, very well put. And my my when I met him, I was I was nervous. I was very legitimately nervous to sit down and interview him at Essen, and all, all because of similar you know you hear stories and you mm -hmm. read stuff on the internet and come to find out he's exactly how you how you say he is he's he's really funny dude <laughs> yeah. so so you know so i i've done uh four train games for for winsome i have fifth one that i'm playing testing and oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um and uh Moving on from the train games, then there's, you know, the, the war games. And really with the war games, those really started as just like, oh, I'm just going to do a war game as as a lark. And then that turned out to be the the first one I did, uh, as you Blood do. on the Alma, okay. was the first game I ever had published. Now, it wasn't the first one to find a publisher, but it was the first one to actually Make come it to out. market, right. Gotcha. Yeah, sure. Because I, I even had a, a Euro game that had a publisher. Okay. It, it just never came out. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, they, they ran a Kickstarter for it and just couldn't get the money for it. And it just, you know, it didn't happen. 
you know, and that's when I'm actually trying to shop around now, which is uh, it's a game about horse breeding. Horse breeding. So, okay. Horse breeding. Yeah. No, in regards to horse racing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you breed horses, you race them, and you bet on them. You get money from uh, stud fees. You get money from winning races. You get money from um, the uh, betting. So, you know, that's when I kind of got to polish off a little bit because that was something I designed, you know, seven years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. But, uh, yeah, so I'm... Um, but uh, the war game was the first one to get to get published. It was a, a magazine game, um, and I did another game as kind of a sequel to that. And then uh, eventually, what happened is, um, so the publisher that I was working with on, on my first game, um, that's uh, that was Lock and Load Publishing, uh, Mark Walker's company, and he left that company and formed uh, Flying Pig Games. Okay, I'm, I'm do, familiar uh, with that. Yeah. You want to do a magazine called Ya. Uh, I did not pick the name of the magazine. Um, it's Y A A A H, or maybe one y too many A's. Y A A H. Yeah. Okay. With an exclamation point, of course. And uh, I was the editor of the first seven issues of the magazine. So at that point, I am uh, designing, developing war games for magazine and editing a magazine about war games. And then I just basically uh, fell fell into that, and when it came time for Mary and I to kind of set up our, our own company, mm -hmm. uh, we decided to do it uh, war games because we huh. were talking uh, even when I was just getting started. You know, if I can establish some kind of reputation as a Euro game designer, the money really isn't in the design at end of things un unless you have a big hit. Sure. Uh, the money where we could do this as like an actual job or profession is more in publishing. So we were talking about getting into publishing once I had some kind of reputation to trade on. Oh, right. interesting. Hey, and, hold on real quick, Tom. I hate yeah. to do this, but I'm going to try and get rid of that beeping if I can. Can you do something on your end for me? Uh, I can try. All right. If you All go right. into Skype. All right, where is the Skype window? Okay, here it is. All, All right. right. If you click Skype in the top left corner, the drop down menu. Um, top left corner. Top. Okay, I'm in the top. Okay. See where it says Skype? No, I don't. Um, a hey, Alex. Sorry, guys. Uh, it just, I, I, I want to try and be able to there's fix a, this so it doesn't go to the last. Yeah. And it, We're going to try and corner. mute all the sounds for in Skype. Yeah, um, I'm I'm not sure. He says, okay, so we're in the top left corner. It should say Skype. And then profile and then change and sounds. Then profile and change sounds. Oh, it's up It's up there. Okay, yeah. that's why I didn't see it. Uh, and then once you click on change sounds, uh, you there should be a button on the right-hand side there that says mute all sounds and see if that helps. Okay. So we want change sounds, and, and there's a button on the right that's mute all sounds. Because hmm. it tell him it sounds like somebody's playing Pong. It sounds <laughs> like somebody's Atari. playing Pong, it says. Uh, uh, hmm. We're, okay. we're, we're, we're in. So we went this. It okay. should pop up a new window. It says sounds over on the right-hand side of that pop-up window. Oh, it either says there. enable all sounds or mute all sounds. From my Skype profile. Okay. Uh, <sighs> <sighs> Again, it's one of those things. I'm not sure about this one. Okay. See, I haven't. I don't see the no. change sounds at all. Okay. So, we, so, so Skype. Max and Skype. Then profile. Might be a little different. Okay, he, say, he says it's Max Skype. Is it, oh, is that, that uh, okay. Uh, Max, I have no idea. <laughs> um, if you go, uh, I'm thinking if you were to somehow get into the sound, uh, the options for sounds. Okay, so, sound options. Or just the options, then sounds. Okay. Options and sounds, maybe. I'm looking at notifications or audio video. Uh, he has, okay, he has a audio video. Oh, he. Right. He can probably hear you because 
I got the headphones, so okay. Yeah. There should be a thing to where it shows ringtone, dial tone, busy signal, et cetera. I know this makes for awesome, awesome uh, stuff, but it, it's going to be better in the end, and we can always okay. edit all this out of the podcast, so there's that. Okay, there should be a ringtone or dial tone. Something. Yeah, there should be a whole bunch of different sounds that you can mute. Okay. And you notice it's actually stopped. <laughs> oh, has it stopped? Uh, the 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 Atari Pong. I, was, I wasn't hearing the. I wasn't oh, hearing the beeping. it's only on our end then that we can hear it. So hopefully it won't be in the podcast. Yeah, it will <laughs> okay, be fine. So like, oh, the, here you like go. Bri Brian is saying it's but under audio sure, video but... for Mac. Yeah, so hopefully... It's under audio video for Mac. Is this a Mac? This is a Mac. Oh, that's. Okay. You have a Mac. I have a Mac. I'm, I'm an artist. Very disappointed <laughs> I'm, I'm an artist. Come on, cult, cult. Uh, all right. All right. Okay. What all is right. Any so we're what good. Are we talking about yeah. All right, cool. Uh, All right, so oh, there it goes again. <laughs> well, you know what? We'll deal with it. We'll try and edit it out. So okay. be it. All right. So as we were saying, uh, if, if Brian, if if you know how to how to mute that, then in uh, for a Mac, let me know. I will appreciate it, and I will have Tom uh, mess with it on his end. Otherwise, you guys are just gonna have to deal with it. So sorry about that. All right, so you were talking about how uh, having a reputation uh, will help you yes. yeah, uh, we, get we, going. We, we, yeah, we, we wanted to do that, we, and that's I, – I wanted to – I didn't want to just start a company r right on, on the outset of, of designing games because, first of all, I wasn't confident if the games were good or not. Okay. That's why I wanted to make sure I got publishers for games. And I also didn't want to just be – Someone who just appeared out of nowhere with, you know, please buy my things. I'd rather have like, oh, that's Tom Russell. He did that one game I like, or that two games I like, even who knows? And I'll, I'll get some of his. And so we were talking about that right from the get go. Um, when I was still thinking I'm going to be a Eurogame designer, and that's that's kind of where the name came from. Because we were like, well, what what are we going to call this company? And Mary's. Uh, maiden name is Holland. Okay. She's Mary Holland Russell. And we thought, you know, if we call it Holland Spiel, it would sound like one of those European companies. One of those German companies, yeah. Yes, yeah. So the thing, the thing, <laughs> and when it came time to, to start publishing the war games, we said, well, we already have this name. We might as well use it. And we were a little worried, like, well, it's not really a war game sounding name, but really with any kind of name, once you've started releasing stuff that's what the name's associated with and so, i i i think so i i think you you have a very fair point that it doesn't matter if it's you know squirrel nut zipper games wh whatever it doesn't matter yeah. the name it's just once you get a rep kind of like what you were saying regarding yourself once you get that mm -hmm. reputation it doesn't matter the name yeah, it's just the reputation and what you are right yeah yeah, exactly. And so that's kind of what we uh, went with there. And that's why that's why we will release a game with a name like Supply Lines, the American Revolution, Northern Theater, 1775 to 1777, or uh, Agricola Master of Britain. I got so much <laughs> flack from people. <laughs> like, how, how, how naive are you to release a game called Agricola? Master of Britain in, in, in the year 2016. I mean, there's already a game called... I know there's already a game called The Grateful. It's a great game. I love it. But it's... What else am I going to call this game about Agricola? You, you know, the Roman general. The general. Dude, and, yes. Right, right, and, right. And his governance of Britain. And everyone's like, well, the game's not going to sell. People are going to get confused. No, no one's gotten confused. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. It's, it's like one of our our best selling titles speaking of which uh, small tangent have you have you ever seen the 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 write up about agricola that this is yes. a war game yes right yes. <laughs> it was, it was, oh that was so much fun uh but yeah it and you know it it hasn't it hasn't hurt so i mean i I mean, you can't just call a game, you know some, some dumb thing it needs to have a, a, a name that makes sense for the game but it's yeah, you, you, you're not gonna. Um, 
people, especially for something like war games, where it's kind of a niche market, it's not going to be on the same. It's not going to be on the shelf next to the Rosenberg game. You're you know? sure, sure, you're right. So that that, yeah. that actually makes a lot of sense. So, okay, so let's go big picture now. Uh-huh. I kind of I so I I you read yeah. Let's try this again. You wrote something recently on your blog uh, that I found really kind of fascinating. And this kind of leads into a question. This is going to be a long way to get into a short question, I think, um, about how you were considering front loading decisions of a game for an age of sale game that you're in the process of designing. Yeah. And how things didn't quite work out how you imagined they would. Uh, But I found the discovery of the design process, the interesting part on that. So long way to get there. How does your design process work then? Well, um, and you can talk about that in particular or just big picture. Yeah. Um, well, it, it starts either with me thinking, you know, I want to do, uh, a game of a particular topic or, um, Sometimes it just starts just being interested generally in a topic. I do a lot of reading, a lot of history reading, just to to, to learn um, about different topics that may or may not ever become games. Who knows? Uh, once I think I want to do a game, I kind of sit on it and spend some time uh, just kind of researching it passively. Because if you go into it like, okay, I'm going to do a game on this, I'm going to read these things, to find what fits my mechanics, you're gonna end up with a garbage game. You you need to let it kind of stew a little bit and you need to kind of be open to new input, new information, so you have something. And then once I kind of come up with a, a, a big idea or a mechanism or something that's gonna bring it all together, that's, that's kind of the thing I need to kind of wait for that's when I start designing the game. By that point, I have kind of a clear picture of what I want the game to be. I want the game to do these things. I want to feel like this and look like this. And then I just start writing rules, putting pieces together, play testing, play testing, play testing. Uh, and generally how I know when I'm done with that process is the game looks like my picture of it. I generally don't go into it as like, well, I'm going to explore these things as I'm designing the game because that's a very inefficient way to do it. Okay. Now, so, sometimes I'll have this idea for the game, like this age of sale game, and then it just doesn't work. <laughs> right. You know, and then I'm going to have to, you know, regroup and, and rethink it and whatnot. But um, other than than that, so, it's, it's kind of... So but, how do you how do you start it then? You you said you just you stumble on an idea, so it's more the either the topic or the theme first, or me, I mean, then you're talking about uh, mm-hmm. getting me- Is mechanisms it mechanics to or work. Theme? Okay, uh, it you know it it's gonna depend on. It, it's gonna be different sometimes for for, for different um, topics. Okay, you know. Um, Sometimes I'll, I'll just kind of hit on the, the mechanism first and then kind of set that aside until I have something where it makes sense to fit those together. And then sometimes it's more, okay, I have this theme. I have this idea, this thesis about this. How do I represent that in a game mechanically? What is the kind of cool mechanic I can marry to that? So, in order to make it something interesting, because I, you know, I've done war games that are, you know, kind of normal war games, hex encounter, uh, zones of control, CRT, but I've never done any like a real like normal vanilla war game. There's always something more going on there, right? Which is and, a good thing, I would think, right? Yeah, well, it, 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 yes, yes, it is. It definitely is. But I can never just like take a basic war game system and make a game. I mean, there needs to be something there to, to give it life. Something unique. Something unique. Um, uh, something compelling, something fun. Um, you see that it, it's more readily apparent in some of my more unusual games, like something like supply lines is, is pretty idiosyncratic. Right. But, um, 
something even like uh, my medieval war games, right? Um, I mean, there's some very simple mechanisms there, but each game has has something different in it. Um, so do you like, go into a design looking for that, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, a hook then, that, that tweak or that, that, that... To a degree, yeah. Okay. But you... Yeah, yeah. So sometimes because... you're saying that that is what you design around, you know, you get inspired yeah. by, oh, hey, this is pretty cool. And I'm going to yeah. design a game around that. Pretty much. I mean, it, it, the design has to have a focus. Sure. It needs, it needs to have something for everything to focus on and build towards and support. Because otherwise it's just a, a, a list of, of mechanisms and procedures and, and phases. You know, especially with war games, it can get very procedural. Right. I don't ever want any of my games to feel really procedural. Okay. I want it to feel like you're making decisions that, that matter. Um, and I, I try to pay attention to kind of the competitive side of things, I guess, to a degree. In I what like way? To do, well, I, 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 I want the games to be a, a fun, competitive experience. Um, and I, I, I like games where you are so okay so so one thing i try to do in a lot of my games is have uh what's going on is that when you are doing something that makes you stronger somewhere it's going to make you weaker somewhere else it's, it's going to create this kind of tension with both players having that situation both players being weak and strong in different places you know probing for for places to strike and going for for the jugular, as it were. I mean, that and, makes, that's thematically accurate, right? Yeah, if you're yeah. if you're pulling if you're pulling troops from one area, moving them to another, obviously you're weakening one area, strengthening yep. the other, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's trying to do that, um, and sometimes with within traditional war game mechanisms, but only to a point. Like I've done one game. That has the odds based CRT where I count up factors and compare to that guy's factors and figure out the odds ratio. I've done that one time and that was more as a as a, as a direct challenge to myself to to play by the rules, as it were. <laughs> you know? Like follow the script of oh, this is what a war game should be. This is what a war game should yeah. Yeah. That that was a game I did for White Dog Games called uh, Von Monkey's Triumph, which I I really like it. It's a fun game. Uh it it's probably the closest thing I've done to like a vanilla war game. It did not sell very well, and the the reason for that is the box cover. Because when it first came out, the uh, cover uh, had the Eiffel Tower on it, which the Eiffel Tower didn't exist at the time <laughs> of that battle. So Oops. everyone's kind of like, like, look at this game. Like that 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 is what the game is defined as. It's the game with Eiffel Tower on the cover now. Immediately, they withdrew that and put the Ark to Triumph on the cover, which makes more sense. But that's still the that's, that's, that's still what people associate the game with. And, and, and that's going to be something that war gamers absolutely pick up on. Oh, yeah. So. Well, all right. So let's let's move on from. So that. OK. So that's war game side. How you. I, I shouldn't say just war games, but say something like 4X that's going to be coming out. Similar, like, oh, hey, I went down this rabbit hole. I found this interesting. Hey, I can make a game about this. Yeah, well, 4X. Um, so 4X is a game that when I was designing it uh, originally, because that design has been kicking around for a long time. And we should um, we should clarify for folks that, that 4X is not like 4X, like, uh, you know. No. Uh, conquer, you know, or, or the four X's. No, it's foreign exchanges. Yes, it, it's trading currencies. There are seven currencies in the game, and each currency only has value relative to the other currency. So each currency exists in a currency pair, and you are trading them. You enter into contracts with uh, the bank uh, to trade them at a set rate, but later. So you make a contract now to trade, you know, one of these for two of those. Um, and then that's only resolved like four or five turns later, 10 turns later, whenever. And at that point, maybe the exchange rate isn't one to two. You're still doing it at one to two. And hopefully you're making a profit and not sustaining a loss. 
This sounds fascinating to me. You need to yeah, hurry it, up it, with this game, it, really. It, well, I mean, the, <laughs> the game's designed, and uh, Cole Worley's doing the art, and he's almost done with the art. Uh, we're probably looking at an October release. Okay. Just because we, we need time to, to market the games and pace the games, right? Sure. So, and we like being a little bit ahead of the curve. Like, we want to make sure we have two, three months ahead so that when something happens, uh, you know, like we just have a bad month or whatever, we, we can, we're still ahead. Sure. I know that makes sense. I get, yeah. I get that. Right. So, um, but that's a game, like I designed the game and it's like, this is the nerdiest, driest, most uncommercial game. I'm never going to sell this. And Sign I, me up. Right. <laughs> I, I, I tried to sell it. Now I, I went to a few of the, um, like the 18xx publishers. I thought, okay. well, this is the closest thing I can find to this. Maybe they'll look and they're like, no, that's too nerdy for us. <laughs> and it's just like, <laughs> like, like, all right. Well. And, but, uh, we, but we were thinking with Hollenspiel, you know, the way we publish games, we can publish a dry, nerdy game where it has maybe a limited market. And if we sell X number of copies and X is a very small number, we're still in the black. You're still good. So, right, right, right. Yeah. So, so the, the great thing about owning a company is that I, I can publish what I want. As long as I can convince Mary that, that it'll, it'll, it'll work. Like I keep threatening that I'm going to do a game on the Barbary Wars and the War of Jenkins' Ear, like some really nerdy, obscure stuff. And I'm only half kidding there. I'm probably going to do it. It's on my list. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good to be the king as long as you can get the co-king, i.e. the queen's okay, right? Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. As long as, long as I get the empress to okay. I sure. Think. All right. So we'll talk more about Hollenspiel in the second yeah. half here. But um, So a couple, of, a couple of questions then on that is, who is it that you're designing games for? Are you designing games for Tom? Are you designing games for who? Well, I'm I'm designing games to to be played by people, obviously, obviously, and uh, not necessarily just for me, because there there is probably stuff that I would put up with in a game that others wouldn't. So I, I get that stuff out of the game, as it were, um, because a big thing is, is making sure that I do engage, that I do have an audience. Because when I was when we were making films, when I was uh, doing doing the uh, novels and all that sort of stuff, I never really was able to engage. And okay. sometimes I, w I was like deliberately not engaging. There is a film we made, a uh, comedy film, and uh, there's a scene before the credits. It's a feature film. The scene before the credits, which is about a utility bill. It's about someone arguing with the utility company about a bill. And that's the scene that runs before the credits. It is 25 minutes long. It is a third of the runtime of the film. It's so that's says that's, that's not necessarily very commercial, you know. <laughs> and and we had, we had festival people who were like, no one is going to watch past this part. You you are doing this on purpose to to see how uh, how it, how far can you push it, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I mean, it was to a degree, but for us, it was really funny, you know. But so. But with the games, I don't ever want to be so niche and so limited that I turn off all the people for whom that game would resonate. Like Forex will work for certain people, certain groups of people. It's not going to work for, yeah, it's not going to work for a whole bunch of people. Right. But as long as the people who it would work for are going to enjoy it, then I've, I've done my job. Okay, so the most. So what you're saying then is you're designing, it depends on what game it is you're designing yeah. on who yeah, you're exactly. designing it for, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and sometimes I'll be pleasantly surprised by how well a game does. Like supply lines, I did not expect to do as well as it did. Now, I've always believed in that game, but. Dude, I, logistics I, is awesome. Well, yeah, but <laughs> I, I, I did not think I'd be able to get that that many people to, to enjoy it. And the only times when I've had like really games that were like real flops were games when I, I was trying to design for like a super broad audience. So I did a, a fantasy skirmish game and I did a uh, 
uh, a sci-fi game. The sci-fi game is called High Speed Hover Tank, and it is about hover tanks that move at high speeds. That's right? really, wow, right. I would have never yeah. gotten there. Okay. And, <laughs> and I thought, this is going to be the one that takes off. I don't really want it to as much, because it's, it's su such a, a broad, popular kind of, you know, beer and pretzels game. Nobody wanted that. <laughs> I like it. Mary likes it. A couple of people do, but you know, like six people played it, and, and five of them I know personally. So it, it it didn't it didn't do well at all, and so I, I I'm not really chasing but, that, that. But it was successful super. in a sense, though, that it let you know what not to do, right? Oh sure, oh sure, and I I enjoyed the heck out of doing it. You know, I mean, it, it was a, it was a fun game to to do. The thing with sci-fi games uh, and fantasy games, for that matter, um, is that the art costs are so much more than what you get with an historical game. And so, if it flops, it is an expensive flop. Ah. And so, so, like at Hollisfield, we're looking at a couple of sci-fi games, not not by me, um, but we're going to be very careful with like how we're going to do the art because there's a certain level of art that's expected for those kind of games. Okay. Um, you know, you, you, you can't put NATO symbols on, on, on uh, space marines. <laughs> you know? But um, at the same time, for, for the sci-fi market, a lot of guys, they want the minis. Okay, you know? right. Sure, sure. You can't do minis. You know, so it's, it's a tricky thing, I guess, is what okay. I'm saying. Okay, all right. So... My favorite question to ask whenever I have designers on for these mm -hmm. conversations here, my favorite question to ask is because I get all different kinds of answers and I get a whole lot of laughs usually from designers is how do you design, how do you decide when a game is done and when do you put it to bed? Um, how I decide when a game is done. Well, it, it kind of comes back to uh, having the kind of, picture of what I want the game to be. Once it looks like that, then it's probably done. Now, I might kick, kick it around a little bit longer just to double check and make sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something I talked about in, in one of our, our podcasts a while back uh, with my Charlemagne uh, game, right? which that pretty much was done, but I waited a couple more months before releasing it to blind for blind playtesting. And it's just because I didn't want to be done with it. I knew I was done with it, but I didn't want to be. Because when I finish something, especially something that's big like that, it's exhausting. And I feel kind of listless, and I'm difficult to deal with for a couple of days. I and listened to that episode, that. and I can I can completely understand where you're coming from. That, wow, this big project's done. Now what? I, I have this I, hole in my life. Yeah, and I have other projects. It's just... I can't like I I know I should do them, but so I mean <laughs> so it's basically just just waiting until until that point or so it's hard. Like sometimes I'll know immediately. Like okay, I am done. I'm definitely done. Let's get it out there. And sometimes I'm like I should sit on this, or I just want to sit on it because I don't have another big thing ready. You know, it, it varies really. Um, All right, so let's let's circle back then on. How do you get this picture in your head of what it is that you want a game to be? So well, is that at the very, very beginning or somewhere along the process or, or what? That's pretty much, I mean, it, before I start any actual design work, before I start like really writing rules, making counters, whatever, I, ha I have that picture. I don't start it until I have that picture. Now, sometimes, very rarely, that picture is going to change somewhat significantly over time, but generally I have that. And I have that that thesis, as it were. Like, I know that I want the game on, on this topic that is going to be through this particular lens. That, uh, like, Optimates at Populares, which is my, my Roman politics game, I, once I figured out the kind of core mechanic of that which is that every time you do something it it makes the base of the other political side angry so they then are able to do more to reverse that and you're able to do more to reverse that and so on and so forth kind of a tug of war that gets more powerful yeah 
Yeah. Um, and, and you have kind of you know, reactionary elements and all that. Once I figured out that kind of thing, it was much easier to um, have a picture of the game and what I want it to be. Now, that's still the picture I had changed from, from the start to the finish because during that period, I, I wanted to include um, a couple of more thematic elements that I ended up cutting just because they, they didn't work or I really I didn't like them. Like okay. I had ideas, I'm like, okay, this will be part of the game. And I found I was purposefully avoiding those parts of the game, and that's a good sign to cut it out. That makes sense, you know? right? If you're if you're the designer and you're avoiding doing these, then they probably ought to be removed, question mark. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. And the other thing is uh, when I know the rules, then I know I'm pretty close to being done because – if the the rules had to be simple enough that I know them without looking them up. <laughs> right. I remember you. I, I've heard you talk about this. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I have, I don't know, 24, 25 games that have come out. Um, there's a lot of rules. I don't want to keep looking up the rules to my games. I get them confused or mixed up. So I keep them as simple as I can. And so once I've gotten to that point where they're that simple and that elegant, you know, in a way... Uh, especially when I first started designing games, when I was more in the in the Euro game camp, I had uh, a little maxim above my little workstation, which is that uh, a game should eat its own tail. You know, everything should fold into everything and, and be very, very, very elegant. And I tried to apply that approach to war games where they don't usually always have that kind of elegance, but they should. They okay. should. They should be that, that, so that simple. That's forward. what you're striving for, at least. Yeah. Yeah, so, so sometimes I fall short, you know. Every, you know, but generally fair enough. Cool. All right, all right. So here, this is we're gonna we finally have a, a fix apparently for the for the beeping that you don't hear. Okay. All right. All right. So and we can edit all this out after the fact. So here we go. Okay. So if you hover at the top until the yep. bar drops down of the yep. Skype, click okay. on Skype, click, click on, on Skype. preferences. References. Click on notifications. Notifications. And then click off uh, play all sounds. Uh, I don't see play all sounds. I see play sounds related to calls, play sounds related to messages, uh, play sounds related to contact availability. Turn all of that off. Unclick okay. all of that. Uncheck it all. Okay, I've done that. Is that? Yeah, and then if there, I don't know if there's a save or anything I, or I apply. don't see a save. Okay, then I think we're good. That should take care okay. of the problem. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Brian. All right, so you ready to get back to it now? Here we go. Okay. Do you impose? Really? Just as we do that, it starts up. Too funny. Oh, too funny. All right, we're just gonna deal with it at this point. Don't sweat it. Yeah. Here we go. Do you impose any limitations within your own designs, whether it's components, scope of a game, or anything like that? Do you, on your own self, as a designer, having uh, excluding yourself as publisher here? Yeah. Well, I, I do tend to design with certain uh, components or parameters in mind, and, and those are pretty standard, uh, like, war game things. For the war game especially, now, for, for like, the... The Winston games, I mean, I, I need a, a map of some size and, and some wood bits, and wood, wood bits are relatively cheap. So I sure. Don't, I don't, and, and John pays for them, so I don't, I don't stress too much about them. <laughs> but, All right. Uh, like with, with the war games, I, I design around specific parameters that I always have in mind, which is, uh, you know, am I going to have a, a 17 by 22 inch map sheet or a 22 by 34? I never done 22 by 34 yet. It's all been 17 by 22. But maybe I'll, you know, I'll go up a, a notch soon. Um, counters, I look at, you know, I mean, I need to represent whatever units are, are there or present or whatever. needs to be enough pieces to to do whatever we need to do. But, uh, you know, generally I'm, I'm going to get 176 little cardboard squares on a sheet of counters. Okay. So I design around that number. Like, I don't want to get 150 counters because I have like 30 blank counters. What or 180 to, to where you have to have a second sheet, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you don't want a second sheet for four counters. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> and, 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 and even further than that, um, it, 
you know, when you, the actual mechanics of cutting the counters, you have um, blocks of counters. You know, there are, on our sheet, there are 16 in most blocks. And there's going to be some slight variance in the way it cuts. Even with a laser, there'll be some slight variance. So if you have counters that are two different colors, one's going to splash over on the other, possibly. So I try to limit it to multiples of 8 and 16. You know, and like, that's just something I naturally do. If I had to put a blank in there to make it up, I, I do. So, you know, in a way, I mean, that is kind of a publisher restriction, but as a designer and publisher, that's kind of the way I aim for it, I guess. Okay. Did you, no, I, did I, you aim that way before Hollenspiel? Um, I did with um, some games. Now, like Blood on the Alma, I didn't. Uh, and then I had to actually kind of cut counters and, and, and reorganize things to fit a particular parameter that was given to me. And then since then, um, you know, I worked with White Dog. Well, I knew they had 88 counters on a half sheet, so I designed 88 counters. And I did the magazine games. I knew that's, that's what that was. So, um, so far I haven't come across a game where I needed, you know, some weird number or where I couldn't fill it up with blanks or status markers or whatever. You know, um, so so it's physical limitations. Are do you put any other uh, self-imposed limitations in your design? I mean, it needs to be short enough that I, I can play it in a sitting. Okay. I, I I I haven't done any games that are. I mean, supply lines can take three hours if you're playing it to completion and no one's uh, resigned or anything. But uh, that's about as long as it gets. Um, of course, Charlemagne's have about three hours too. But generally, it's a ninety-minute to two-hour game. Sometimes, sometimes just an hour, which uh, you know, I, I have two cats at home. <laughs> All right, and, and I and I and I have limited table space. You know, uh, so a lot of my games are on seventeen by twenty-two because that's about as much as I can fit comfortably on on the on the table dining room table. That's and it lasts fascinating for two or three that hours that actually plays a part in the or it actually drives this. The, that's how long the cat will leave it alone. Because I need to actually test the thing. <laughs> if I can't test it, you know, it's no good. I, th I, you know? I think that might be my all-time favorite th nugget that I've gotten from a designer up to this point is this is why it plays in this time space because that's how long the cat will leave it alone for. That is fantastic, Tom. Now, now should I get like a, a... I have a table in the garage I play games on sometimes, but... Usually those aren't my games. Usually that's, you know, I'm playing some other war game or, or uh, some of the game I'm trying to learn. Like, like for a while I had, um, what's the name of that? The the Tresham game about the Dutch Revolt. Dutch Revolt, yep. Revolution, yeah. Dutch Revolt, yeah. Yep, yeah, that's it. I had that in my garage, like trying to learn to, to play that, which that, that is a very procedural game. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. They actually but, played that at Heavycom this year, and everybody seemed to really enjoy that. But yeah, very, very procedural for sure. Yeah. All right. So, uh, what are your uh, what are your favorite, or I should say, what's your favorite mechanism that you or, or theme, depending on how you want to answer that, that you've explored in any of the games that you've designed? Um. I mean, I kind of like all of them, but uh, of the, course, right? Which the, is your favorite uh, kid? I get that. The the, the, the chit pole in uh, Agricola Master of Britain because that it works differently than other chit pole type games. So you have uh, three cups that you put the counters in. There is a friendly, unfriendly, and hostile cup. And those represent how different tribes, different parts of different tribes in Britain, feel about. Agricola and Roman rule. And every action you take in the game adjusts those blindly. So if you do something that makes people more friendly, you take something from the unfriendly cup into the friendly cup. If you do something that irritates people, you're going from friendly to unfriendly or unfriendly to hostile. So you have a general sense of how people feel, but you don't know who exactly is with you or not. And the result of that is it creates a feedback loop. So stuff you do early in the game is going to affect stuff later in the game. And it's going to have a clever. different play experience. I'm very proud of that one. I and, dig that. Uh, yeah. A lot of solitaire games, a lot of solitaire war games 
Uh, they're either just games where you are a kind of captive audience to the story the game is telling, right? Or they're kind of stateless in that you 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 know you you choose if you're going to roll the die against that guy or that guy, but that's not going to affect which card's coming up next to make the move. You know, you have no control over how they're all going to feel. How they're going to react to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas here, it's not like you're playing an AI because it's not an AI, but they're, the things you do actually have repercussions. And it seemed to be very popular. It was, you know, the most popular uh, game that I've ever done. Um, it's, you know, for a while, the Winsomes were the games people, you know, owned the most copies of. But, right. you know, now... Um, Agricola, I think, is the one people own the most copies of. Uh, people seem to, to really enjoy that and uh, had a lot of enthusiasm for the uh, sort of sequel, which is uh, Charlemagne, Master of Europe. We got blind playtesters on that. Uh, and, you know, we, we do that for several games where we try to get more eyes on it. And what that happens is, yeah, and what happens is you will have, you know, Maybe 10 people volunteer, and maybe one actually gets it on the table. Just because, you know, life happens, life gets in the way, right? Sure. With Charlemagne, we had a much higher number of people volunteer and a much higher number of people who came through with it. So it just that, that enthusiasm for it, which, which uh, really is exciting for me, because I do want to be engaging with the audience and making games people are going to play and get on the table. I, so, I mean, yeah, ultimately, so that, that that is the goal. I mean, sure, you want to sell them, but also yeah. you want to have your games being played, right? Yeah, exactly. So that I say that probably is is the, the favorite mechanism right now, anyway, because okay. the, the thing the thing with that is that um, you are so you're dealing with like an insurgency situation, but you don't have perfect information right there are some games uh there was a, a game on uh, nicaragua which was like back in the 80s not not one of the newer ones uh where you had like a track for 10 different factions and went up and down on the track but you have perfect information there and you wouldn't have that in that situation so yeah you don't know what what the, yeah sure that makes sense yeah. I, it, it you, seems you obvious a, nowadays doesn't it yeah. that you wouldn't yeah yeah so you, you have a general feel, like, you know, like, yeah, there's more uh, in the hostile cup than the friendly cup. I'm going to be in trouble, but you don't know exactly who is, is with you there. Okay. So. Cool. So how do you feel that you've grown as a designer now that you've, you know, got a number of games under your belt? How do you feel like you're growing? Well, I, I've certainly grown more confident and, and more efficient with it. Uh because, you know, early on, I, I, I was really uh, kind of just blindly trying to feel my way around and figure stuff out and not doing a great job of it sometimes. Whereas here, I kind of have things I can fall back on. I have uh, some experience. I mean, I, I've done this two, two dozen plus times mm -hmm. successfully. So, it, you know, having that confidence just lets me do bigger and more ambitious things than I was doing previously, whereas I was feeling more constricted previously, and I was kind of nervous about tackling, like, really popular subjects, because, like, oh, I'm not going to do, I, I probably will never do a bulge game, because I, I don't There's 738,000 yeah, of them? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, 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 the thing is, you know, what, what will make mine stand out? So I kind of gravitated towards obscure topics, because it's going to stand out anyway, right? But I'm becoming more confident in in approaching that stuff. So I would say the confidence is like the big uh, growth as a designer. Um, I think. I, I and know. I think confidence. I, I mean, it doesn't matter what you're doing, right? The, yeah. The the more confident you get in something, the better off you're going to be. Whether it's designing games, podcasting, whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Selling cars. I mean, it's it's. Confidence makes the world go round. It really does open doors for you. And it opens doors within yourself, I feel like. Yeah, and it allows you to do to do your best work. Yeah, uh, uh, totally or, agree with or, that. Or, or, uh, or, or, excuse me, earlier today, uh, Mary and I went to see the movie uh, Baby Driver, the Edgar Wright movie. Uh, I've, I've, right? I'm hearing good things, yes. And it is probably the best movie that he's done. 
and that's that comes from from the confidence from from he's learned his craft and and he's and it it he has confidence in what he's doing and it's it's not a parody or a satire the way his previous films were he's he's confident enough where he can do, he can do it seriously i guess so that, uh yeah confidence yeah. is an amazing thing right yeah all right so let's transition over on to put your publishing hat on here for a minute right. let's let's talk holland spiel specifically how do you go about selecting games to publish that aren't Tom Russell designs? Uh, well, we tend to look at uh, either. Well, first of all, we get people who who submit games to us. Okay. And, and we'll look at them and see what what is this game? What does it have? You know, what is new or different about it? What can we we grab onto? Like we're looking for some kind of hook, I guess. Um, otherwise we kind of approach, uh, designers if we want to work with like, Hey, do you have anything? We'd love to publish something that, that you, that you've done. Um, and that's, that's how it worked out with, uh, Cole Worley. Um, I was familiar with Cole from working with him on an issue of the magazine and okay. I, you know, heard about PAX uh, premiere and I said, you know, if, and also uh, he wrote a, a lovely strategy article on Northern Pacific. I remember that. And, and you know, that's put them in my good graces there. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, take and, note, and, does uh, you know, uh, possible designers out yeah. there take note? All right. And and I, I, uh, you know, so we asked him, like, you know, if you have a game, we would, would love to look at it. And he said, Well, I have this idea for a game about uh, opium trading. And we said, That sounds terrific. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it paid up pretty well for us uh, and for him. It is, it's, uh, it is our, our best-selling and most popular game. Um, and then there are so the other designers we approach like that. We and uh, then there are times when we want a game to exist, but I can't do it. Like I wanted a game on uh, Plan 1919, Fowler's Plan to End World War One, right? With a massive uh, tank uh, attack. And, you know, I try to do that for about a year. And so just, knowing your limitations is what you're saying. Yeah. And, and, and I, I just realized, like, I, I can't make this work. But we knew someone who did a bunch of World War One games, John Krakowski. And we said, you know, can you do this game? He said, yeah. Uh, same thing with um, Operation Unthinkable, which is uh, one we just came out with. about uh, Brand new, right? Yeah. 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 About uh, Churchill uh, attacking Stalin. and uh, World War Three. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right at, the end, right at the end of World War II there. And um, we asked designer Ty Bamba, like, could you do a game on this topic? He said, sure. And that, that that's, that's how that one uh, came about. Was we wanted the game to exist, but um, I knew I couldn't do it because I, I can't really do anything beyond, like, 1870 or so, I think. Okay. I just, I, just, I, I don't have the brain space for it, I guess. Okay. Wow. But but there's something to be said. Uh, I mean, with that confidence comes knowing your limitations, right? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, ex exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, so we look at, at, at games and, of course, you know, we play the games. We we, we test them. We develop them. Um, you know, are they fun? Do we enjoy them? Uh, I don't always look for what specifically is to my taste or Mary's taste because people have different tastes. You know, I don't really dig tactical games all, all that much. You and me both. And, um, you know, we actually had someone approach us with a tactical game, like, a, and, like, we just, we had to pass on it because we don't know it well enough to be able to develop it and give it the attention it needs, right? So there are some limitations there. But, I mean, there are plenty of tactical games out there. There's a new tactical game every week, and they're, and they're always starting. <laughs> uh and in the Eastern Front, so I mean, they 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 got that covered. So yeah. unless it's doing something different, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. all right. So on that note, has there been a design that's ever been too, I don't know, esoteric for Holland Spiel to publish that you've turned down due to that reason? I mean, because opium trading's not enough, right? Not that I can think of, actually. I mean, if someone approaches with like a really weird idea. You know, assuming the game works, right? We're more than likely to publish it. Well, I mean, seriously, you know? weird, weird yeah. and unique is 
it's a hook. It's a good thing. I mean, it, that's it is, it that's is. what yeah. I enjoy in games. Mm-hmm. I mean, opium trading. Come on, dude. Supply in in uh, the American Revolution. Really? I mean, yeah. that's awesome. Now, I think we'll probably stay away from the uh, Euro game space, maybe the train game space, because I, you know, I I do train games for Winsome. I don't I don't need to do them. Which okay, so that that eliminates that question. Then, have you ever well, considered? Though going a different direction than Winsome with train games, whether it's yourself or Company X, not saying you uh, should, but no, I'm just. But, but, uh, honestly, I, I'm I'm just very happy with what Winsome has done with the games and and done for I guess my profile as a designer. Um, so I haven't really had any interest in in going kind of elsewhere with it. That makes uh, sense. <laughs> I, I guess if I had a winsome game that that you know they turned down, then then I might look somewhere else for it. But that hasn't happened so far. So okay, all right, so, that... so good. Okay. Um, yeah, but I think generally staying away because someone asked uh, uh, Game Geek uh, not too long ago, like, uh, is is it possible since since uh, as a couple people asked. Uh, since you have a publishing company that you can, can license the, the rights to the Winsomes and republish them. And I, I'm like, I, I don't think so. I don't think that makes sense because really when you want to, I, I can't really speak for John, but I'm sure. assuming he wants to license it for, for money. <laughs> First of all. <laughs> and, That's and, weird. And, and, and and wants um, the the game to uh, you know get there on, on on store shelves and to have a nice nicer more deluxe um, edition, right? You really think John wants that? I, I mean, well, I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not being well, argumentative. Well, let's, let's say, let's say the gamers would want that. I think. Oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So I I think um, you know, how long should we do something like that? Is it's a lateral move, really? Because we 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 have we have the paper maps, right? We, we're not going to be on, on store shelves. You know, the, the one thing we got the most the most flack for of anything else is infamous trap not, not not having a mounted board. You know, I think the reason that is is a product of the success. Now, th- I mean, this is me just looking from the outside in. Yeah. But I would think that with the success that it's had being, I, I mean, at least it, to some yeah. small degree, being a 2016 Golden Elephant Award finalist for for Game of the Year, um, I think it's reaching more people that aren't accustomed to yeah. having a piece of plexiglass, so on and so forth, um, to where they're I, like, I wait, right, what is yeah. this? What is this paper map thing? Yeah. But even when it just came out, like when it first came out and we got the initial flood of orders, there were a lot of people who were um, colorful in, in, in their, in their, in their uh, <laughs> appropriation about, you know, how – how I, I paid $50 for this. How, how – how, you're trying to rip me off, and it's like, no, we're, uh, we're not. We're, we're, a war, we're a small war game company. Yeah, a little you know. boutique – publishing house yes yeah. so it's uh ah so so th- th- that was like the the thing we got the, the the most of uh from from people and you know that and people wanting to know why it costs so much to ship stuff overseas and it's right just, which it's just well, actually, I, I was going to that that's actually coming up here in a little bit but we there's no reason that uh that we can't talk about it now. So do you want to explain for folks once and well, not probably not once and for all, but it, it, explain to no. folks why you're not able to get folks across the pond, your games from Holland Spiel. Okay. So we're a small print on demand company. W- what that does that means, mean for folks that might not know? Okay. So that means we, we have a, a printing partner who, when you ordered the game, he prints up the game and boxes it and then mails it to you. So beca- when, you do, when you do any kind of printing, the more you do, the cheaper each unit is going to cost. Of course. Which is why a, a traditional print run 
is going to be a thousand copies, two thousand copies, however many thousand copies. You know, we don't do that. So uh, our games cost more to produce. Uh, you know, I was talking with someone about uh, another war game company and you know, they have a game that sells for $60 and it costs them $8 to produce. It costs us a lot more than $8 to produce our games. Because of that, it limits our ability to get distribution in general, even just domestically, because, you know, domestically, the the distributor or the, the retailer is going to pay uh, much less than the MSRP in order to sell the game. We talked to someone who uh, owned our friendly local game, owns our friendly local game store about this. And she said that she pays about 50% of the MSRP to get the game in her store and then sells it. If we were to sell it 50% of the MSRP, we would be selling the game at a loss. That is how much our profit margin is. Now, the good thing about this is that it enables to do weird, strange games. Because you don't need to sell as many copies. I don't need to sell as many, exactly. Um, whereas... The, the bad thing about this is that, you know, we can't get that distribution even just domestically. Now, as far as going overseas goes, um, you know, we have to get the product from here to there across one ocean or another. And the shipping costs ha has to go somewhere. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And we talked to some of actually several uh, kind of war game distributors in Europe about this and you know they said oh we want your product I said okay well we can give you this much off and they said no that's terrible I'm like well that that's what we can give you and still stay in business right uh, we were looking at publishing the game publishing copies for the european market in europe i was like gonna say for, could you do like a print on demand overseas so right we had, we had a couple people looking into that and the prices we were getting from the overseas market were much more than what we're doing here domestically, which um, if we were to just sell the game at cost for what's produced, you know, in Europe, mm -hmm. it would be the same amount that people would pay ordering it from us domestically and, and paying shipping, shipping it over. Wow. Only we wouldn't have profit over uh, with the other way. So we, we need to stay in business. Sure. Obviously. This, 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 this is my, my, only source of income, our only source of income is are the games we, we publish here. So um, that is why the the overseas situation is the way it is. Uh, this is a question that we get asked pretty much every day. No, I know. And that's why I wanted to touch yeah. on it. So oh, it gives I, you a I chance to, it. yeah. Um, what like, about, I, I, oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, what about co-publishing? Is that something that you've ever entertained the idea of? Uh, not not so far. I mean, it might if if we find someone who might be interested in that, we we, we might do that. Okay. I mean, the whole thing is that you know we're we're a small print and demand, low volume kind of company, and and we like that, and we okay. want to grow our business. But you know, we get people who ask like, why don't you do a Kickstarter for your games? Well, first of all, we'd be doing you know twenty Kickstarters a year. <laughs> one for each game right right yeah so uh so first of all that, that that's not so great and secondly i don't know if we can sell you know two thousand copies of supply lines it's selling really well i don't know if it makes sense to print two thousand copies okay you know because then we gotta store it like in our garage <laughs> and i only have so much garage space <laughs> and, and 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 winters up there can be rough you don't want to park the car oh, outside oh Oh yeah, no, no. Winter in Michigan is terrible. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, now we do what we do off. Now we, Mary and I talked about this when we started the company. Like, should we even offer our games to European customers? Because um, before Highland Spiel, she was working for a a little folio company um, that did war games, mm -hmm. and they had this similar problems. As well as well as well we're having, and she said, you know, I, I hated to always be disappointing people by telling them, you know, no, I'm sorry, this is how much it costs to get it over there. Right. But we said, well, let, let's offer that, but let's also offer a uh, print and play option. So for all of our games, we have print and play versions of War Game Vault. Now I don't know if it's going to be really economical to do a print and play 
of horse and musket, which has five counter sheets and a big map and, you know. Right. But it's there if you would rather do that. And it's, you know, 13 or 14 bucks. Uh, and then you, of, you make your own copy yeah, out of that. Sheets. Right. Yeah. I think honestly, and I might I might be stepping on myself, and I might get yelled at by uh, my better half, by Amanda, <laughs> by by offering okay. this. But um, maybe uh, as we get closer to Essen time, we might be able to make a bulk order on behalf of some of the folks here in the peanut gallery and in the herd that are heavy cardboard fans and pack a bag. Uh, full of Hollenspiel games to mule over there for Essen for folks. I don't want to I promise mean, that, but well, that might be an we, option. We're, okay. we're we're okay with that. We're, yeah, we're I reckon okay you that. were, right. You know, we had someone approach us about Essen, about uh, who, who wanted to get some copies of Traffic, right. uh, particularly for Essen. Um, and the thing is just, you know, we tried to figure out the cheapest way to ship it, and it was... So they're going to be two, three hundred bucks to ship, you know, the fifty copies they wanted. So it, right. it didn't, and it wouldn't make sense for them because on their end, you know, either they're going to upcharge to cover that shipping, or they're going to be taking a, a loss. A loss, right? So I'll I'll yeah. see what we can do. You and I can talk as okay. as time gets later, and I can go into the uh, our Slack channel, our Patreon Slack channel, and, and stuff like that and see if folks are interested in that. But anyway, we're getting off topic. I apologize. But that, that, I, want, that, I, I want to be able to... I mean, we've done a couple of playthroughs on the YouTube channel of An Infamous Traffic. It was a Golden Elephant Award finalist for a reason. It is a fantastic game. Not to say that your designs also are not. I'm Just as an example. Yeah. But... I want people to be able to experience these games. That's why I get excited whenever, you know, a long out of print game is getting a reprint. I think that's a great thing, you know, not a bad thing yeah. because I'm losing value on a game or, or whatever. So I want to be able to spread the joy of this hobby for more people that are interested in that. So I, if that's our way of being able to kind of pay it forward, then, then that's something that we want to explore possibly doing. So yeah. cool. All right, so moving on. Getting a little bit heavier here for a minute. Okay. On your blog, you previously wrote that you've become better at seizing the moment. How does that manifest itself in relation to Hollenspiel? I write a lot of blog posts, so you're going to have to... Uh, what was that specifically? I uh, no, no, Shoot. Um... No, it, it's it's more or less just seizing the moment and capitalizing on things. And I think this kind of ties in with the whole more confidence thing. Okay. So in in how does that show up in on the publishing side of things as far as being able to be like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, we can do this. Yes, let's do that. Well, I'm hmm. I mean it uh I mean we definitely been able to do more. Uh, I think because we, we've been because we've been reasonably successful, mm -hmm. uh, we're now able to be even more successful. It, it's kind of it's kind of like those those games where you the, the better you do the the better you're going to do. Sure, it takes money to yeah. make money. That kind of yeah. concept, right? Sure. Yeah, uh, and you know, like when we first started out, I don't think we would have a, a game from a designer like Richard Burke. Like, I don't think he would have wanted to do a game with us necessarily. Okay. At first. So because you're saying because now that you're more established as a, as a publisher. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, you know, we're now able to do games with cards. Like, when we first started, uh, we couldn't do cards because we, we just couldn't find a good source for them that, that was uh, cost effective. Okay. And our very first game, uh, The Shell Campaign, which is a, uh, it was a second edition of a Brian Train game. We turned those cards in into chits because we could not um, do cards. Well, now we can do cards. Now we can do them effectively, and now now we are able to uh, put more in the game, and we're able to do kind of more unusual stuff, um, like forex. Mm -hmm. Like I don't think we seriously would have considered forex, which is a game I've had for years. Uh, we wouldn't have seriously considered publishing that when we first started Hollenspiel. But on the success of, of Infamous Traffic, 
and getting more attention to us in our games, it, it makes more sense to publish that. You can take so, more risks then, I guess, is yeah, a way to yeah, put it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it, yeah. And okay. uh, and those risks, I mean, they do seem to be paying off so so far. I mean, we haven't had a game that, that hasn't made his money back. They've I mean, all made a profit. That's... That's fantastic, right? I mean, isn't yeah. that the ultimate dream? Well, yeah. other than having a massive hit, I would think as a publisher yeah. to not lose money on a, on any game. That's that's yeah. kind of a pretty cool mark yeah. to have, I yeah. would think. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Um, you know, a game like um, House of Normandy is is a medieval quad game with four four battles in it, and that's not a you know, super. I'm sorry, you saw one of the comments. I... <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought. I, I, I shouldn't have looked over on that side of the screen. <laughs> uh, uh, for, the, for those listening after the fact on the podcast, uh, what, one of the resident comedians in our, in our Patreon Slack channel, Brad, he's like, great, got to send Tom a prototype of my game about a porta potty empire. So... Yeah, I, I think I think Mary might veto that one. I mean, we we're talking before about you know thing about obscurity, right? With, 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 and it's not that anything to be too obscure, or esoteric, but there's, there's stuff that <laughs> cracking me up, guys. Uh, there's stuff that uh, maybe would not be in in the best taste. Sure. So so a game about a porta potty empire would <laughs> would not necessarily fit. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, no, that makes sense. I mean, you want to keep and, it, and, keep and, it... And, and more seriously, there, there are certain lines that we wouldn't cross. Like when I was looking at supply lines of the American Revolution and it, it took off, I thought, well, what else can I do here? Well, first of all, I can do the second half of the war because that's only the the, the North Theater right. that game. And then I was like, what what else can I do? Can I prize to other conflicts? And I was looking at uh, the American Civil War, and but I immediately said, well. I don't want to do a game focused on supply, logistics, and manpower in the Civil War because that's just going to kind of. Now you're getting up. into slave trade. You're getting into all of that stuff. Well, I would think, well, right? Well, less that and more. Um, more that if you put an emphasis on a game on, on the logistics aspect, and on the. Uh, you know, the resources that are available to a side, right? Right. Um, then that's what the story becomes. You know, the story of supply lines is the story about those supplies. The American Civil War, that's really dodgy because you have this uh, lost cause mythology that says that the South lost because um, the North had all these resources and so on and so forth. And that might be an aspect of of the Civil War, but if you make that the focus of the game, it it that becomes what the game is. That becomes the story the game is telling. Gotcha. And that okay. story is one that is repugnant. So there are certain things where you know I we will draw some kind of line. Okay. But that's there's not much because we'll publish a game on opium trading. Sure. You know? Right. <laughs> But see, and okay, so let's explore that a little bit. Now, I understand now, and I and I, I want to tread carefully here because I don't want to uh, overstep or 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 fill in the right word here. But at the same time, I feel like something like that can be done as long as you're respecting history, but also respecting. I mean, you're not glorifying these things right that that obviously nobody is wanting a game to represent i get that but like uh, let's use an infamous traffic as that example obviously the opium trade was was not a good thing for the chinese in the 19th century obviously but it was abstracted out but at the same time it's also dealing with history in a, 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 you know, a real history. This is what happened. And how do you, is it just a personal thing that you're like, you know what, this is where I personally draw this line? Or do you think that it just doesn't belong as a 
gameable topic, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, I mean, you know, I might be somewhat a personal thing, but like in the case of draft picks, uh-huh. you the, the game is, is about the opium trade, and but it's about it in it. In a, in a very pointed, very cynical way. Right. And I think the game kind of communicates a point of view in, in a way, if you're looking for it. Um, in a way that a game like Puerto Rico mm-hmm. doesn't. Uh, Completely vis-a-vis. glosses over it. Like, Correct. Yeah. So it engages with it. And it engages with it in, in, in a very cynical way. I would say that the, the, the sense of humor in the game, in Infamous Traffic, right, uh, goes a long way toward, towards us saying, yes, this is something we want to do. Okay, that's fair. And we you touched know? on that in our review of it last week. Yeah. Yeah, so, it, it, I mean, it's all a matter of, of how, how, how you focus it and, and what what the focus is. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a complicated, authority issue, and it, and I do have like an emotional reaction to certain things. I'm going to because sure. I'm a human being, and human beings do that. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's a tricky thing. It's particularly because we I design and publish a lot of war games. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a tricky thing because a lot of war games they only engage partially with 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 the topic. Right, because you you're not seeing the side effects or the end result of what yeah. it is that you're modeling, right? Yeah, yeah. There's something I wrote in uh, I wrote a couple of blog posts kind of exploring this this kind of thing, mm-hmm. and I use a quote uh, that uh, Stanley Kubrick gave in an interview when he was working on his uh, film on Napoleon that never got made, um, and and he said that um, you know warfare is, is, is like Watching two eagles uh, from the distance, and it can be very beautiful, but you zoom in and, and they're, they're tearing apart a duck. You know, that movement, the maneuver, you know, that's very appealing. And, and I think war games can explore that very well. They don't do so well with the duck, with, you know, what, 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 with what it is. And so it's, it's sometimes it's hard to explain to people that I do I, publish war games i design war games because they don't have that frame of reference mm, okay and, and they just uh they just you know like my uh my family um you know they're, they're very happy that we're doing well but my my grandfather who fought in world war ii and in korea uh was like i don't know how you could make a game a game out, out of this out, right out, sure. out of battles you know yeah, it, it, it's all about personal perspective and experiences, right? Yeah. That's uh that's interesting. So, okay. All right, fair enough. Um All right, so let's go let's let's flip it over to something a little bit more happy and positive then. Okay. Sure. Um uh you mentioned in your last podcast that you were happy with the way Holland Spiel is working for you in in terms of size, output, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um so what's your vision for the company down the road, be it growing, et cetera? Or do you have one? Is it just, hey, let's see where this, you know, this puppy goes? I mean, we, we have a, 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 a vision and a, and a plan, but we also are trying to be adaptable and play it by ear. Mm-hmm. Like the plan we had to start with um, would have us at a very different place right now than where we are now. Uh, the success of traffic and Agricola, uh, Master of really, Britain, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, that, <laughs> not a farm game. Uh, success, the, the success of those two games, um, and our, our line in general, and our ability to kind of engage with people and get them to like us, I guess, and like our products, <laughs> um, has put us in a better position because. I did not think I would be doing this full time at this point because we started the company, uh, August. I mean, we started publishing August of last year. Okay. And by my last month, uh, working at my, my, my day job was in February. Wow. This has been a 
hold, and we we said maybe, maybe in a couple of years we'll be able to, it, and this happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would like the company to keep growing, and we have been doing very well um, this past uh, quarter compared to the previous quarter. We keep doing better, which is what we want to do, you know. But we want we don't want it to grow beyond the point where we can control it, you know. I uh, completely and, understand that. And we like the fact that we are able to do uh, little games and and publish. Um, stop stop reading the chat, Tom. Oh, me? Just see it on the corner of my eye. <laughs> <laughs> so his Tom. buddy, Tom's buddy Brian, is in there. Tom includes a note in every game. Do you like me? Check yes or no. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so, and, and Mary just stared at me. She has no idea what. Um, but like, you know, we publish usually five games every three months. Oh, that's all. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we, so you know, some some months we do two games in a month. Some months we do one game in a month. You know, it depends on the month. And right. uh, you know, we like that pace. Is we're able to make a living at it with that. We're able to give the time and attention we need to develop the games as we're working on them uh, full time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we like that. I don't really see us getting to the point where we're going to be, you know, doing a traditional print run with like two, two, three thousand copies for at least most of our games because that that stops us from doing uh, kind of obscure stuff. Because if you're doing two, three thousand copies, you want to sell two, three thousand copies. Right. Right. You don't want to pay for and, warehouse space. Yeah. Or and uh, garage, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I know of a publisher, uh, a Euro game publisher, who uh, his first game, uh, he didn't really understand the business very well when he started. He published like 20,000 copies. And <laughs> they're mostly all still in his garage. Right. Oops. And 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 the, the amount of uh, money he had to put, I mean, I'm very risk averse. All right. <laughs> I, so, I, as a I, former professional poker player, I understand that phrase. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I, I hear about people who get, get themselves in trouble trying to, you know, when they're publishing games or, or they, they, they might lose their house. I think there was a, uh, what was the, there was some kick. Glory to Rome. Where, yes. Like, I don't ever want to be in that position. Right. So I want to keep it. The size that we control, where Mary and I can do it, you know, day to day, and it, it lets us do what we want to do uh, with our lives, which is great because I, I I own my own time. I don't need to ever go in because I I was driving when I was working. Uh, the commute was an hour, so I would drive an hour to get to work. I would work between eight and eleven hours, and I'd drive an hour to get back home, and then try to design games on top of that. And, it was very difficult to do that. That's exactly what I was doing with the podcast and YouTube channel. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I, I come from a familiar space with you mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. And, uh, but the, the, the last, uh, the month, the month before I quit, um, we had done well enough. We had made as much money as I was making at the job. I was like, well, we we can probably do this, and uh, the the week or two before I quit, I got in a car accident. Uh, I was driving to work. I was stopped on uh, six ninety six, which you don't know what that is. That that's an interstate. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, and so I was stopped. The person behind me did not stop, and rear-ended me at sixty miles an hour. Ouch. Damaged the car. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, uh, all I'm things okay. considered, Somehow. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's just but, but, stuff. You can get that replaced. I, we can't replace Tom. I keep telling Mary that. Um, <laughs> but you, um, it just made me think, you know, this could have been it. Going to this job that, that I, I'm not enjoying. That's eating up all my time. And so all those things kind of came together. I said, all right, let's. Let's try this, and it's, it's worked out so far. The very first month uh, that that I had quit, um, 
was actually the month where we, we basically uh, made zero dollars because of things we had to pay for. And th- but after that, we've been we've done fine. All so right. the first month was a little scary. Was sure. Like, was, was this a terrible idea? <laughs> but, um, so far, it's been a good idea. It's, it's right. done well for us. Uh, you know, cool. I, I get up every morning and play board games. I mean, that's that's my job. Rough life, right? Yeah. And, and, and you get more done uh, playtesting and, and developing that's if you're doing so, it all day than so you're doing it on the weekend. I know. Isn't that weird? <laughs> uh, all right. Which game from Holland Spiel is your favorite to play yourself? Whether it's yours or someone else's. Mm, that's a good question. Um, so, so, so once once I'm I'm done developing a game and it's been released, I it doesn't see the table as much because I'm then developing another another game. Sure, but um, I. Really like an infamous traffic, first of all. I mean, it's just it's done really well. It's really nice to get that on the table. Um, I really like supply lines. I really like um, Agricola, short. I mean, you play it 60, 90 minutes. Master of Britain. So, yeah, Agricola, Master of Britain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just used to calling it Agricola. You're fine. Uh, At this point, it's just a running joke. You're fine. Don't sweat yeah, it. I know. I'm not sweating. Um, and I like Optimates at Popularis, which, you know, Solo Right is actually doing a little better than, than it was. But, you know, being a, a politics game, it uh, doesn't have quite the same market as a war game or even a game like, like Traffic. Right. Um, but I really like it. And everyone should play it. You should all buy it. <laughs> well, I mean, I it's up here over my left shoulder because we're going to be reviewing it in the upcoming months. Okay. So, so uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps. So, I, I'm uh, I, I, okay. I wasn't gonna ask this, but I'm just curious because I'm gonna be a little self indulgent. I'm curious how the Golden Elephant Award uh, nomination has helped traffic for you, or has oh. it? Oh, it, it helped. It helped. Yeah, we saw a significant boost in sales uh, after the nomination came out. Cool. Uh, and uh, the two videos, particularly. Okay. It, it, it seemed a uh, boost in sales, and it, it really, uh, it really helped us. Uh, particularly the month when it was announced, because we were doing a little slow that month, and that just picked everything right up. Because I think that was the month uh, Automatis came out. Okay. Which didn't sell quite as well as we hoped, but then if Miss Traffic pulled up the. The slack there. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm glad oh. to hear it. Cool. Yeah. Because it's always it's always some you know, out there in the ether. In theory, it helped, but you know mm-hmm. we we never know. So that's good to hear. I appreciate it. Good. Yeah. Glad to hear. All right. So that's pretty much really all I got, except for the uh, the quick fire questions that I ask all uh, everybody who sits down for conversations with uh, heavy cardboard. So. Um, so with that said, you ready? There's, it's a series of six fun yet thoughtful questions, oh uh, that off the top of your head, no, you're not allowed to just tank over it and think real hard. Okay. All right. You ready? Mm-hmm. All right. First one. How old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? Uh, so how old do you think you are without knowing your age? say 30 30 is a good 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 uh good okay. age all right if you could master one skill that you don't have right now what would it be playing net hack what is that net hack it, it, it's a roguelike computer game from the 80s it is one of my favorite games i am rubbish at it <laughs> Not not be, I, not be like a woodworker. Not learn how to play the violin. Net hack. All right. Awesome. Yeah, I love I, it. I, I, I love to play net hack to completion once. <laughs> I've never been able to do it. All right. If you could have dinner in conversation with any person in history, pick one. Go. First one off the top of your head. Um. I'm drawing a blank. Uh, 
Besides Mary Holland Russell. Um, well played, sir. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, you know, you have Jesus, you have, you know, Alexander yeah, the Great, you have. I, I, just, I just can't, like, who Who would I want to. Who would um, be thought Charlie company? Bowers. Charlie Bowers, silent filmmaker who um, he did animation, uh, like stop motion animation and live action together in, in his patented Bowers effect. And the films are just delightful. I would love to pick his brain. There you go. Awesome. Great answer. All right. All right. So what are number four? What are three things that you want more of right now? It could be physical. It could be characteristics. It could be an idea. It could be like stuff like time. It could be money. It could be, you know, patience. It could, whatever you want it to be. Three things well, that you want more of. Patience is a good one because I'm I'm not a very patient person. Nor am I. That's why I throw that out uh, there. <laughs> um, time because I never do seem to have enough of it. You know, I I have all my time, but uh, I get to the end of the day and like, how how did this day end? You have twenty four hours. How do you how use I, them? Yes. How did I run out of that? Um, what else would I want more of? Um. Oh, I don't know. I'm pretty content. You know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with where my life is. So it, it's hard to, to want a lot of things. You know, I want some Criterion Collection DVDs, but I don't know if I'm ever going to get to watch them. So, I mean, what? Well, if you got the time, then, then there the you time, go. If you got the time, then I'll be able, to, be able to watch them, yeah. <laughs> All right. Number five, what do you appreciate most in your friends? That they get me. Not everyone does. I dig it. That's, uh, I think that's important. That's something that we all want in our friends, right? Yeah. I like that. All right. All right. And number six, <laughs> I feel like this is always a softball because I always get the same answer, but I'll try. What is your absolute dream job? I mean, I, I, I have that. <laughs> right. I, I, it, 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 it's hard. It's hard to, you know, be, beyond that, um, I always wanted to uh, get into comic books, you know, write comic books. Okay. And uh, that's hard to break into. That's ridiculously hard to break into uh, because you known either. That. Okay. Yeah. Because, the you know, the story of how to break into comics Everyone has a different story. There's no one way to do it. Every way is different. And you need to really be able to push yourself uh, in ways that I can't. I can't really push myself on people. I'm more oh, someone. Oh, okay. You know, I, I don't I don't have that, that gene, as it were. That was a big problem with uh, the Euro games, with trying to pitch them to publishers. They always wanted me to come to a convention to pitch them. And I am terrible at that. Aha. Uh -huh. So. Okay. All right. So since... You are in, you know, indie film guy. So, bonus one. What okay. one movie most deserves a sequel? What one movie most deserves a sequel? That's that's a really good one. That's a really tricky one because <laughs> if a film really deserves a, like if it's really good and deserves a sequel, it probably doesn't need one. <laughs> You know, Tom, going like, going levels deep on this. I mean, I, I can think of like my favorite films, right? And there's like there's Barry Lyndon. That's one of my favorite films. There's uh, anything by Wes Anderson is one of my favorite films. I wouldn't want a sequel to any of them, though. They certainly are more worthy of it than some things, but I wouldn't want it. I don't think. Um, you know a movie I really enjoyed that came out last year that did that probably will not get a sequel. It's a new Ghostbusters movie. That should have a sequel. I enjoyed it. Done. That's my answer. All right. There you go. <laughs> All right. So seriously, um, this has been a lot of fun and it's been really enlightening to hear, I don't know, I guess both the design side and the publishing side of things from you. So I really appreciate you uh you taking the time to do this. And also for Mary, 
because I know, you know, this is she's hanging out for a couple hours. So be sure to tell her thank you as well. Um, and on a personal you. note, um, not something I want to, you know, uh, get really deep into or whatever. But what? when I was going to quit my job, um, I just wanted to say thanks that uh, you sent me a really thoughtful uh, message that uh, that you didn't have to like you didn't know me really but when I was going to make a run at doing this full time and that was really meaningful and it really it really touched me and I really appreciate you doing that so thank you Tom that meant a lot so all right so that's all I got um hopefully you had a good time with this and uh hopefully it didn't put you too much on the spot no, it's fine. No, cool. Uh, All right. So everybody watching at home and listening after the fact on the podcast, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, all this is brought to you guys and made possible by our patrons uh, over on patreon.com forward. Uh, so it's patreon.com forward slash heavy cardboard. If it's something you want to support and help support us being able to do this full time and bring more of this content to you, then consider uh, supporting us. We definitely appreciate it to the 276 patrons that we have out there thank you very much and on behalf of amanda and myself and big thanks to tom and mary at hollenspiel definitely go check them out hollenspiel.com and uh yeah they have some really unique and fascinating games really excellent games as you guys can see behind me so go check them out at hollenspiel.com otherwise thanks a lot everybody really appreciate it so, Tom, say goodnight. Goodnight.